Good morning. How are you all doing? Wonderful. Was it good to sleep an extra hour or not? Yeah, you didn't really notice it with cell phones actually changing the clock automatically. It's like, I don't even know why we do these social media posts. Because I'd rather have you show up early anyway. No, just kidding. You guys are all fabulous. You made it on time. So glad to have you all here uh, this morning. I'm excited about uh, today's message, which is the second message in the family series. Um, and if you were here last week, um, we're building on what I said last week, is that, uh, that God is calling us to be the priests of our homes. And today we're going to speak about marriage and we're going to speak about uh, family relationships between us and our kids. And some of you might be thinking, well, I'm not married, I don't have kids, uh, so this message doesn't apply to me. I guarantee you there will be enough um, connection for you in this message as well. And I believe it will bless you, it will help you in your own relationships as well. So, uh, so make sure you open your hearts to what God wants to say to you this morning. Uh, but before I get into that, uh, just two important announcements uh, that I want to share. Uh, the first one is that next week, everybody say next week. Next week, we have a guest speaker, and many of you know him already, and if I say, oh, yeah, some of you know who's coming, John Wyatt is coming back from Jacksonville, Florida. I mean, you're excited about that. So um, if you haven't seen him before, you don't know, you know, you're you're going to be in for a treat next week. Um, so he's one of the pastors at Celebration Church in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. So he's going to be with us. And uh, you will want to bring a friend for that message. He's going to bring the third message in this um, family series. So it's going to be very powerful as well. And then uh, another thing I want to highlight to you is foundations. And um, if, you, um, if you're new to Thousand Hills... Uh, it is, you know, this is really the way to, uh, to membership and really finding out what we're about, uh, foundations. And it's actually a four-week video uh, class that we offer to you. It's, it's, uh, it's very short. If you watch all those videos after each other, it'll be like 40 to 45 minutes of your time. Uh, and then uh, you, we close it off with a uh, w um, workshop, which is held every first Sunday of the month after every service. So that means next week is going to be the uh, Foundations Workshop. But please make sure you watch the videos first before coming to the workshop because otherwise you have no clue what we're talking about. Not really, but you know, it's really important that you actually get the point of those videos. And uh, even if you, if, you haven't been, um, if you have been part of Thousand Hills for a while and, and you haven't watched the videos, I really want to encourage you to watch those. How many of you watched the Foundations videos already? It's like, that's way too few people. You know, we all need to watch these. I'm, you know, I'm really excited about it because, you know, there's a lot of changes that have been happening at Thousand Hills uh, through the last year. And uh, one of the things that is really important is actually the whole family dynamic that we believe in, the start of the deacons, you know, so many other things that have changed uh, this last year. And actually in the foundations class, I, I will explain it to you through video in, in the comfort of your living room. So who doesn't want to, you know, just relax and sit back and watch Pastor Sebastian during a week? No, not really. I know you're, you know, you're, I'm done with this guy after Sunday. No, but this is really important. So uh, just to kind of build together, make sure we're, we're, uh, you know what we're all about. Watch those videos. And if you're new, come to the Foundations Workshop afterwards as well. So Foundations, all the information is on the card in your um, bulletin. So family, that's what we're going to talk about today. And if you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to go to Ephesians chapter 5 and Ephesians chapter 6. So look it up on your, um, in your you know, paper Bible or your e-Bible, whatever you want to, whatever you carry along. And I want to talk about, um, about marriage and relationships with our kids. And I want to talk about what it means to, to experience wholeness in your family. Um, and what is really interesting is that in Ephesians chapter 5, um, what Paul does, he actually um, brings out a parallel um, between Jesus and his church, which is called the Bride of Christ, and, and the relationship between a husband and, and his wife. Um, and he brings out this great parallel there. Uh, so that's why we're going to dig into this chapter. Um, and, um, but before we do that, let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to open the, hearts, open the eyes of our heart and uh, to speak to us this morning. God, we come to you this morning. We thank you for your word. And Lord, we just pray that today you would open up the, the, um, the, our spiritual ears and eyes so that we would really 
understand what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us this morning, that our lives will be transformed. Our marriages are going to be transformed. Our families are going to be transformed as well. God, we ask that in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. So last week we spoke about being the priests of our home. And, and that's a real important topic there. Um, and I believe God is calling all of us to be priests in our homes. And today we're going to talk about um, marriage relationships. Um, before I get into that, um, something really important is that you, you may be here today and you're wondering um, why a message on marriage. My marriage has fallen apart or is falling apart. Uh, my, um, you know, I'm, not, I'm not married. I wanted to be married, but somehow I never found the right partner. Um, I, we see your hurt. We see your pain. And we know that, you know, that God has, has a plan with your life. You know, whatever you're going through, God wants to heal you, bring restoration and, and healing to your own um, situation as well, to your own, you know, your own life with, 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 with God as well. He wants to bring restoration there as well. But um, it is so important for us to realize that, that marriage and the family is such a crucial, crucial part of, of not only the church, but of whole, the whole of society. That's why marriage is under attack. That's why the family is under attack in our society today. So that's, that's why we really make a big point of this. So just plow along. There will be some important um, uh, verses that I'll share that, that apply to every one of us here in this, in this room, whether you're married or not. But I want to start out with a verse that um, if you're, if you're um, married and you're a woman, you may not like this verse, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to redeem this verse. I'm going to make sure you see that, that, that it may actually be more positive than, you, than, than it looks like at first glance, okay? It says this, Paul says this, Wives, submit to your own husband as to the Lord. Submit to your own husband as to the Lord. You can see that in, in our society today, you know, with feminism all around, uh, that this is not a very popular message to actually share <coughs> because like the word submit is actually a it became like a dirty word you know you don't really submit to to anyone so it's a it's a dirty word in fact it's been abused by by many husbands throughout the last hundreds of years you know they they've used this verse as a as a as a, a rationale why they're suppressing their wives well you see it's in the bible right so I'm the boss here. <coughs> Maybe somebody can, can bring some water for me. It's like the cough is coming back. I've been, uh, we've been sick with, you know, like co a cold, severe cold, our whole family the last couple of days. And I was fine until till this started this service. So <coughs> somebody's bringing some water. It's awesome. Really appreciate that. And uh, so, so, it's a, so it's a dirty word. And, uh, but, but can it mean something different? Can it mean something totally positive? I believe it does, because I believe God is a positive God. God has the best of intentions for you, for your husband, for your, for your wife, for your family, for your marriage, for all of that. So, uh, so before we continue, I want to read the verse before this. In fact, you know, when you look at your Bible, how many of you know when, when, when Paul wrote his letters, when uh, the whole Bible was basically brought together, there were no... Uh, chapter divisions. There were no verse div uh, verse, uh, verses either. There were no uh, little uh, headings for all these uh, different parts of, 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 a, of a letter like this one. It wasn't there in the first place. <coughs> so, so what it looks like here is, um, thank you for bringing something. That's awesome. And uh, what it looks like here is, is, is like uh, the, the section here starts at verse 22. It says like, um, 5.22, it says wives and husbands in the ESV version. But in fact, it belongs to the section before. You're amazing. Thank you so much, sir. And it says this, submitting to one another out of, the reverence, out of reverence for Christ. Another translation says, a new living says, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. <clears throat> if you read the context, this is actually not about family relationships. This is more a general statement about how we are to deal with one another in the context of the church, of God's family. And Paul says, we got to submit to one another. That means that, that you got to submit to the person sitting next to you, even if it's not your husband, 
And I got to submit to you and you got to submit to me. We all have to submit to one another. That's like the Christian thing. We're all equal. We submit to one another. That is the biblical pattern that you see in, in, in God's word here. So submission is not only for the wives towards their husbands. It's between believers. And if it's between believers, it means that also the husband is supposed to submit to, to his wife. Really, because they're both believers. They're, they're a brother and a sister, you know, as well. Besides the fact that they're married. <coughs> and, and if you continue reading, what strikes to me most is that, that the, the section that, um, that addresses the men is actually way longer than the section that addresses the women. So it's like, it's like the men need more direction than the, than the women do. And I think that's true, right? Uh, I don't want the women to say this. I want the men to say this. Men, are you agree with me? You need more direction than, the, than your wife does, right? We all, we all need this. So it's like free verses. You, you, don't be too uh, excited here, you know? <laughs> don't be too excited because I'm, I'm going to get you all, right? So it's free verses for the women. It's eight verses for the men, if I count it right. <coughs> so, uh, so the burden is bigger on the men. And verse 25, uh, Paul says this. Husbands, love your wives. And this is the word agapeo. It's, it's like, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a loving thing. It's not a sexual or a sensual type of love. This is really a, a love where you basically give yourself away. And, and, and Paul explains what it looks like. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So basically, the picture here is that Jesus gave himself to the church. He gave his life for the church. And Paul says, if Jesus gave his life for his bride, the church, the ecclesia, you're supposed, you husbands, you're supposed to give your life away for your own wives. That is pretty serious stuff that is, that is written right here. That's like because Jesus, what, what happened to Jesus when he gave his life for the church? He hung on the cross. He gave his self away for the church. And the same thing is true for us husbands. We give ourselves away for our wives. Verse 28, in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Again, husbands, just like Jesus, should give their lives to the wives. That is even to the point of the, the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate price that you want to pay for be able, that you would be willing to pay for your, for, your own, for your own wife. Now my question to you women, to especially those who are married, is this. Who would not want to submit to a man who loves his wife the way Jesus loves his church? Right? You can get a little more excited, ladies. Who wouldn't want to submit to a husband that, that is just like Jesus? Right? And I know us men, we fail. I know I'm not a perfect husband. I know I mess up. You know, sometimes I, I do things. and I don't talk about it with my wife uh, about it. You know, we'll find out later in the service. I'm, I'm just, I just feel sorry for my wife. <laughs> I'm, I'm going I'm to have a severe beating later today. You know? And it's not me beating my wife, it's her. You, know, I don't, you don't have to call the cops on this one. No. Don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry. We're, we're all good here, right? We will be good. Let's say it like that. Verse 33. This is the key to success in marriage. This is, if you, can get, if you can grab a hold of this verse for your marriage, 
And if you're not married yet, make sure that you understand this one because it's going to help you. You're going to be thankful for, for Paul right here. He says this, Whoever let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. I believe that this is the summary of, of everything you can write about marriage. You know, you can have whole volumes of, of books written about marriage, Christian marriage. It's like, put it all aside. Just, just start doing this. Start understanding this and you'll be in a good place. I really believe that. Two words, love and respect. Love and respect. The husband loves his wife. The wife respects her husband. Because there's a different love language that, that wives and husbands have. They function in a different way. They're different than each other. And if, you, if you're, you're dating right now, you don't know it. Because you're like, man, she's awesome. She's, you know, and, 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 and you girls, you, you think the same thing. Wow, he's awesome. It's like, I don't think anything will ever go wrong in our relationship because we're just so perfect. We just match together so well until you find out that you're actually made in a different way. And that's the beauty of God's creation, actually. Because, you know, your wife, you know, the, actually Genesis shows that your, your wife is a, you know, the, the wife is, is seen as, as a helper. And helper doesn't mean that she's less than the husband. The, the Hebrew actually shows that. I, think, I believe it's the word ezer or something like that. And we're actually at the same level. But, but she complements what the husband doesn't have. And the husband compliments in the wife what she doesn't have. It's beautiful. But you actually see it. You know, hear from this verse that, that, that the wife needs love and the husband needs respect. The husband needs respect to feel loved and the wife needs agape love to feel loved. A love that gives itself fully to the other person. Love like the love that God has for us. A love that he demonstrated to us when he gave his only son to die for us on the cross. The problem is that we too often don't realize this. In fact, there's, you know, some, some authors about marriage, they, they coined that idea, the crazy cycle. I mean, you've ever heard of the crazy cycle? Yeah? The crazy cycle is something you have to avoid. The problem is once you're in it, it's hard to get out of it again. And I'm going to explain you how the crazy cycle works because when you understand how the crazy cycle works, it's easier to identify. It starts like this. You know, a, a woman doesn't feel validated or loved by her husband. So what happens? She starts to treat him without respect. Then what happens is that without the validation of respect from his wife, the husband will start to react without love. I've been there. I, I've done this. Sorry, honey. How, you know, it's easy to, to, to go to this place. And then, then when, what happens after that is that, that both spouses, they start to focus more on their own needs. What do you need to get out of the marriage instead of the needs of the other person? This is guaranteed to fail. If that's how the love relationship between your husband, you and your husband starts to play out. The result of that is daily conflicts. There are some bad habits that kind of creep into the marriage. And, and as a result, they will, they, will, they will keep the cycle in place. It becomes a, a, a downward spiral. And then both the husband and the wife will feel irritated. They will feel frustrated by their marriage. They, they have feelings that they're not good enough for their spouse. That they are never able to measure up to, their own, to the other's expectation. And it leads to a tension that, that destroys one's self-image, which makes it even worse. And the result is that the cycle keeps happening with the same repeating damaging effects and the communication between both spouses just shuts down, breaks down. And just keeps going on and on and on and on and on. And the marriage gets destroyed because of that. Usually that's what happens. Like long, long, long before a, a, a couple decides to break up. We can stop the cycle. We need to stop the cycle. And it starts out with understanding that your spouse is different than you are. That they have a different 
love language than, than you have. That they operate differently. They, they need something else out of the relationship than you need. You can compare it with sunglasses. Like, women are made with pink sunglasses. <laughs> they receive validation by being listened to and knowing that they're cherished. So like you and your wife can have a conversation and, and she, just wants, she just wants to be heard. And you as a, as a husband, like I'm, I'm this way, I will come up with solutions, like even after half a sentence. Drives my wife mad. Pray for her. <laughs> and I'm sure... <laughs> And I'm sure she's not the only one who has this problem. I'm sure many wives here have that same problem. Your, your husband wants to solve your issues. You just want to be heard. Because that's how you feel loved. That's where you get your validation from. Right? It's true. Men are made with blue sunglasses. They need to know that they're respected in the decisions that they make. They also need to feel respected by, in their willingness to serve and, and to suffer for issues of honor. That, those are things that are super important for men. And if, if you women, if you take that away from us, you know, we're going we're gonna to have tension, constant fighting because of that. You need to realize that that's how God wired us. And he wired us for a reason that way. So men and women are different. Well, something that's really important, and just a, just a side note for, for women here that are actually in an abusive relationship. If that's you, it is not okay. That the abusive relationship is not okay. Don't feel like you have to be stuck there all your life. If you've prayed about it, if you've talked to your husband about it, and, and, and you still feel stuck, maybe it's time to get help. Maybe it's time, time to, to get some people around you, not just to pray for you, but also kind of help you out of that abusive situation because this is not okay. Again, yes, you need to respect your husband, but respecting doesn't mean that you stay in an abusive relationship that is, not, that is not in any way a picture between the relationship between Jesus and his church. This is really important. So know that. And for both of the spouses, as you learn what it means to respect and to love one another, make sure that you have tons of grace for one another. Tons of grace. Because we're still human, right? We will still make mistakes. And, and if, we, if there's no grace for one another, how on earth are you going to get unstuck in your relationship? We need to give each other grace. We need to give each other time to work through these issues. That's the only way how this can work. It's the only way how we can get unstuck from the crazy cycle. Give it time. Celebrate every little improvement. Because delay doesn't mean defeat. But it's important that we depend on our helper, on the Holy Spirit. Back to verse 33. Let each one of you love his wife as himself, <clears throat> And let his wife see that she respects her husband. When the husband and the wife understand their roles in marriage, wholeness and peace will come to that couple, will come to that family. I think all of us are longing for wholeness and peace in our relationships. All of us are longing for wholeness and peace in our family. But it's available for us once we start to understand some of those biblical principles for marriage. And while we're talking about families, you know, I believe that God also wants to bring wholeness in the relationship with our kids or the relationship with our parents. Um, because some of you, you don't have kids, but we're all somebody's son or daughter, right? So these principles that I'm going to share from, actually from Ephesians chapter 6, because the, the story kind of continues right into chapter 6. Again, that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a real chapter division, right? It's important for us to realize because you know, even if you don't have kids, you will always have parents. And your parents may not be around anymore. Still, God can bring healing for hurt that you still feel 
from the relationship with your parents, if we heed what Paul is saying here. So let's go to verse 1 in chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. So this is right from the Ten Commandments here. Very important. That it may go well with you and that you may live, lo live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Powerful couple of verses here. You know what? Last week I shared this with you, right? For this sermon series, the kids are actually going to have their own version of the messages that you're hearing. And we feel it's so important because they, this gives you the opportunity to not only just ask them, hey, how was kids' church? Was it nice? Did you learn anything? Did you, did you have fun? No, you could actually engage in meaningful conversations with your kids because they're hearing something similar at their level as to what you're hearing right now. And because the kids are up to like 12 years old, we, we, we spare them the comments about marriage. It's like, I, I see my, my, our boys are nine years old. I don't think they're very interested in hearing about, you know, wives and husbands. But they need to hear about their relationship with their parents, right? And Paul says here to, to honor and obey your parents. So, so if, you have, if you have kids over there, you can say thank you later, right? <laughs> this, is, this is important principles right, right, right here. What does it mean to actually obey your parents in the Lord and honor, to honor your father and your mo mother? Because if kids don't do it, their behavior can really upset the family dynamic. It can really bring a lot of damage to whatever is happening in your home. But you as parents, if you're a parent here, there's, there's something on your end that is really important here. And that is that we cannot provoke our kids to anger. We cannot provoke our children to anger. Instead, we need to bring them up, raise them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. But what is that? Discipline and instruction of the Lord. I went back to the Greek to kind of see what it means. Discipline is the Greek word paideia, which is instruction that trains someone to reach full development, to reach maturity. So we, we help our kids to become um, mature people who are dependable, who actually take their place in society the way they should. And the word instruction is a, is a really interesting, interesting word. It gets translated very differently by different translations. But it's, you know, other words that are being used for it is like admonition or exhortation. And what it does is it improves a person's reasoning so that they can reach God's solution. In other words, we help our kids. And this is why, this is why you cannot delegate your... Um, faith education of your kids to Thousand Hills Kids or to the school your kids go to, you have an important role in this. The, the fathers even more so than the, than, than the women, than the, than, the, than the mothers. That's pretty clear because it specifically addresses fathers. Of course, mothers are included too, but the main role here is of the fathers. And we got to learn what it means to, to really bring up our kids in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. And the instruction of the Lord has everything to do with how do we help our kids understand God's Word? How do we help our kids to start thinking in a way that's, that's biblical, that is actually according to the purposes and plans of, of God's Word? That we don't start to think, oh, well, uh, the Bible says this, but it actually means this. And, and no, it's not so important. And there's grace anyway. And there's this and that. And that. And you basically kind of undercut the authority of God's word. No. God's word is, is our guidance for life. God's word is the guidance for life for your kids. And you have an important role in that. And if you are married to a spouse that is not a believer, then you as a believer have the responsibility towards your kids to actually help them grow up in the instruction and discipline of the Lord to, so that they know what it means to really follow Jesus, to really be, be his child. Proverbs says it this way, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart 
from it. Train up a child in the way he should go. You may think, well, I did all I can. I invested my life in, in my kids and taught, taught them about Jesus and still they're wayward, still they're going off in different directions. I believe that if you genuinely did this, if you genuinely actually showed God's love and helped them to grow up in these, these basic things of the Christian faith, that there will be a moment where they will actually turn back and, and, and that they'll remember what, what you've given them along. And we'll talk more about that during, during the rest of this series because you've deposited something in them that will come to fruition, something that will actually draw them back in into a relationship with Jesus. And I believe that there's going to be healing and wholeness in that, you know, in these coming few weeks and in this coming year. I believe 2020 will be, be a year of restoration and wholeness for our whole church. You know what? The key in this is, is actually not what we say, but what we do. Because if you teach your, the kids the word of God, but your walk is different than what you teach them, They'll follow how you walk rather than how you talk. And this is, this is scary, right? Because our kids, they're watching us. They're looking at us. If, we're, if we really are the same on the inside as we are on the outside, that the things we say, that we actually do those things as well. And when we do it, it's a powerful testimony towards our kids that, hey, daddy really does what he believes. Or mommy really does what she believes. And that is an example that is worth following if we're willing to actually model what it means to be a committed Christ follower for Jesus. And it's so important that we follow the way of Christ and that we model that to our own kids. So in this section, Paul makes clear that husbands, wives, parents, and children all need something out of their family relationships. We all need something. Husbands, uh, wives need love, need love. Husbands need respect. Children need their parents, need their parents' patience and investment of time to help them mature. And parents need their kids' honor and obedience because that's how we are hardwired by the Lord. And as we submit to one another out of honor for Christ, God will bring wholeness back into our families. Because after all, you know, we're brothers and sisters, right? So your spouse is your brother or your sister. Your kids are also your brothers and your sisters. If Jesus is their Lord, if Jesus is their King, if they're part of God's family. So we submit to one another. We even submit that way to our kids. This is a biblical principle. And when we do it, when it's not about you or me anymore, but when it's about Jesus and about serving the other person, wholeness will come back into your family. Ephesians 5.21. These are keys for everyone, right? Not just those who are married or those who have kids or those who are kids. And further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And I had to think of Philippians 2, verse 3 through 5, and I'll close with that. Paul says this, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Jesus, that Christ Jesus had. So Paul's using the example that Jesus gave to us, that he gave himself away, that he had agape love for you and me. He uses that example for all of us. It's not about you. It's not about my preferences. It's not about what I want. It's about what God wants, first of all. And it's about what my spouse wants. We got to understand that. Humility is key here. <coughs> it's not about me. It's about the other. You know what? When, when we're humble, that's when the Holy Spirit can work in us. He can help us when we draw near to the Lord with a humble heart. But it all starts with humility. That we step down from the throne of our lives where, where it's all about me, myself, and I. And we allow God to sit on the throne of our lives. That he is number one. That, that there's loyalty towards him, towards Jesus. And 
out of that loyalty to him and to our loyalty to our spouse and to our kids will flow forth. That's how God designed it. So I want to take a moment to, to pray right now and allow the Lord to seal this in our own hearts. God, we come to you humble and, and broken, God. Lord, we're, we're only human and there's so much that has gone wrong in the relationships that we have, maybe with our parents, maybe with our spouses, maybe with our kids. Yeah, there's a different path for each and every one of us. There's a path towards wholeness. When we start obeying you, obeying your word, God, when we start loving our husbands, when we start loving our wives or respecting our husbands, when we start to no longer provoke our children to anger, but instruct them and discipline them. And when we as kids, we start to honor our parents and obey our parents. <coughs> God, we pray for wholeness to be restored in our lives, and our families. God, we proclaim that this new year, 2019, 20, God, this new season, Lord, will be a year of breakthrough and wholeness in every single family. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. And everybody say, amen.